Um, so welcome everybody to uh, the Ridgewood Public Library's continuing sustainability ser uh, series. And I'm, uh, my name's Larissa Brooks and I am thrilled today to uh, have Joel Flagler here from the Bergen County um, Records Extension uh, and he is the has been the coordinator of the Rutgers extension. No, he didn't coordinate. He has so many. In fact, he has so many accomplishments that it's really hard to keep them all straight. Um, because he has been a master gardener coordinator for Bergen County since 1987, and I think he's trained thousands of gardeners. And I know that some of those gardeners are training other people too. So there's a pretty beautiful tree of knowledge right there, also, which is really nice. Um, the uh, Bergen County Extension, in case you're not familiar with it, is, well, every county has an extension office through Rutgers University. Uh, they've existed since 1914, and they are intended to help um, people with, well, it started off helping people mostly with, um, with helping farmers and 4-H youth, and they've evolved over the last few decades. Um, they still help, there still is a lot of farming to help out with, um, but also work on urban forestry, um, parks, greenhouses, nurseries, and all of the other um, kind of uses that we have now for horticulture, like uh, uh, lawns for sports fields. Um, and uh, let's see, and um, Joel is also a horticultural therapist um, working with the disability community, and he is going to talk to us about selecting trees, uh, how we can choose the right tree, avoid mistakes, and take care of the trees we have and the trees we'd like to have. And thank you very much, Joel, I'll let you take it away. Oh, um, what, what, one more thing about uh, questions. If anybody has any questions, please add those to the uh, Q&A. Um, those are, let me see, I can't get that. So if you just add those to the Q&A, we'll get to those questions at the end. You can add any other comments to that, um, but we will uh, get to those at the very end. And this will also be up on our sustainability series YouTube page once I've had a chance to process the video. And I think that's all. Great. Well, I'm so happy to participate in this series. And I thank Larissa for inviting us. Trees is one of my favorite topics. Trees are one of my favorite organisms on the planet. I've always loved trees. And um, we're going to talk about benefits of trees, selecting trees, managing trees, and maybe you'll have some uh, questions, or hopefully maybe I'll give answers to some of the questions you've had about trees. As mentioned, I've been serving Bergen County since 1987 as the Rutgers Agricultural Extension Agent. And uh, more and more, we find ourselves being asked to solve problems with street trees, urban trees, and indeed urban forestry has become a whole new specialty because our suburbs and our urban settings have trees that we value so much, but we expect them to grow in ridiculously absurd planting settings. So uh, along sidewalks and such and small strips of, of earth and uh, it's challenging to say the least. So the whole focus of urban forestry is rather new in the last several decades and our Rutgers is at the forefront of helping towns to manage their precious trees because we wouldn't wanna see towns and cities devoid of the beautiful trees. So as we uh, go to the first slide, uh, I thank Larissa for advancing for me. We focus on what do we get from trees? Well, we get so much um, and we wanna make sure when we're planting new ones that we're doing our homework and understanding the virtues of a tree, all the good points versus the drawbacks. And really no tree is perfect. Each tree has its particularities. There are genus uh, of trees, then there's species, then there's varieties within the species. So you could say maple tree, but indeed there's hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of maples from native maples to Japanese maples. and uh, so very many. So when we choose, we want to know all the good points, but we also want to be aware of the downsides. Downsides could include things like uh, prone to disease. Downsides could include things like 
roots that buckle sidewalks and invade sidewalks. Downsides and drawbacks could include um, a smelly fruit like uh, female ginkgos have been accused of having or messy fruit like mulberries. Uh, so many different um, things to be aware of. How do we find out? Look up the tree. Right now online, you could Google any tree, any variety and find out. There's some wonderful resources. Uh, the Michael Durr book, which is the Manual of Woody Landscape Plants is a great resource because you can read all the good points and the bad points and make a wise selection. So that's selection. We could go to the next slide. Um, but we want to make choices where the good points outweigh the bad. I've started with five S's, which is a good way to start to think about it. And this is even useful in evaluating trees that are already planted in and around your home, your neighbor's home, on your street. We have structure, site, size, space, and seasons. And these are all of the elements that impact the tree and impact the tree's ability to sustain over time. And sustainability is a theme you've been working with. So again, we want a tree that's gonna uh, not have to be replanted in 15 years and not uh, be problematic, but a tree that's gonna live its whole life and be um, compatible really with the conditions in a city or a suburb. So the first S, if we could go to the next slide, gets into all of the structural considerations. And it includes, uh, go to the next slide again, and structural considerations include um, things like, uh, how is it shaped? What's the crown like? What's the root system like? What's the trunk like? Is it a single trunk? Is it a multiple trunk? How strong is the wood? And does it have weak crotches? Those are uh, points where the limb meets the main trunk. What's the growth habit like? Is it pyramid shaped or is it spreading? Is it flat topped? Is it conical? Does it branch? If so, uh, or how? So knowing all of these structural concerns, particularly the root system, is going to give us uh, a lot of information. We have all witnessed uh, streets in Bergen County and other counties where the sidewalks are buckled because the maples that were planted there back in the 40s and 50s, uh, uh, their roots, which are so close to the surface, have literally pushed up on the sidewalks. And that's a hazard for sure. But also, you have a, a, a large tree then, uh, how to undo. Uh, a tree that's um, uh, 60, 70 years old and problematic. So know the root system, preferably in advance before planting a tree. And we have many shallow rooted trees, maples, dogwoods, um, uh, and, and, and we just wanna know that their roots are gonna be more likely to come up through a patio or uh, invade a lawn or a sidewalk. Next uh, slide, please, for the next S. And the next S is site. Hit it one more time, Larissa, and we'll go to site considerations. Here we're talking about the exposure. And you have to look at the exposure to sun right about now, middle of June, looking, we see how much sun there is. All the ground are leafed out so we can get a good uh, uh, assessment of what the exposure is. Some people look up in winter when there's no leaves and they say, oh, we got full sun here, but not so. Uh, we want to know how much sun and shade there is during the growing so from May uh, uh, through September. What's the soil like? How do you know? You run, you run a soil test and the Rutgers Soil Testing Lab for 20 bucks gives you a great uh, um, a, a report telling you the pH of your soil, the levels of nutrients, and more importantly, any deficiencies that there might be. So you go ahead and you amend the soil so that the tree gets off to a great start. We need to know what's doing with the soil because we've seen some horrible stories of soils that are uh, over-limed or have contaminants and are not suitable to support plant growth. And the last thing you want to do is spend a uh, 300 bucks putting in a nice tree 
only to find out that the soil is, is not uh, adequate. So we can do a lot to amend soil. The best thing to do is run a standard soil test and anyone can avail themselves of this service online. Visit Rutgers Soil Testing Lab and you send it yourself down to the lab and send them a check, nice and easy. The, the last thing to consider is drainage. There are very few trees that will grow in sites that have poor drainage. Uh, Larissa and I were talking earlier about river birch. River birch is a good tree for tolerating some moisture as are red maples. But if it's standing water, you really can't expect uh, many trees to get off to a good start because the roots are just uh, inundated and there's no oxygen getting to the roots. So if there's poor drainage, you might want to consider building a berm, which is creating like a three foot high mound of, of soil, soil of known quality, uh, and you, you plant into that mound, into that berm. And that's a great way to go because your drainage is good, the soil quality is good. Uh, so look into that, but drainage has to be adequate. Next. S please, and we're talking about size. And the size is not the size when you're looking at it in the nursery and you say, ah, oh, perfect, six and a half feet tall. It's the size in 20 years, because that's when a tree starts to reach its more mature size. Uh, we've seen horror stories of trees that outgrow their space and now the crown of the tree is interfering with the utility lines and the utility co company is gonna come and hack that thing and then it's gonna die. So um, also trees that get too tall and block the upstairs window of a home or cast too much shade on the house and there's moss growing on the roof and uh, the people haven't been able to see outside uh, in 10 years. Uh, trees that drop a lot of uh, fruits into the gutters. And by fruits, I'm including things like acorns, sweet gumballs, um, maple wing samaras. Uh, trees have fruits. Those are the structures that bear the seeds. And sometimes they can be a nuisance. Hickories, walnuts, um, be aware. Uh, excess screening and shading and total obliteration. So we want the right tree for the right space. I was just advising one yesterday, they want a tree that gets to about 12 feet tall for a sunny spot in New Brunswick. And I had many good recommendations. And of course, the answer was some of the wonderful uh, Kusa dogwood hybrids that don't get that tall, but perform so well, as well as a red bud. And I'll show you both of those. So be aware of the size, not the day you plant it, not 10 years out, but really 20 years out, what's it gonna look like? So we can go to the next S at this point. And that's space, one of my favorite space is how does the whole picture look standing in front of the house with that tree there? How's it gonna look? What's the area that you're trying to fill? What is it that you want from this tree? Are you looking for shade? Are you looking for contrast with the house? Something to tie in? the space between the house and the garage, uh, seasonal beauty, fall color, spring blooms. There's so many different things we can ask of trees, but you have to know uh, what it is that you want. So get in touch uh, with what your wishes are. And uh, the space is an important one. And there's computer programmings where you could take an image of the front yard or the backyard um, and, and they can insert that an image of that tree and you could get a really good uh, uh, sense of the total package that we are creating. Next S. And that's season, also one of my favorites. And we've got four seasons at least. The tree should be performing well in at least three out of those four seasons. So uh, winter weary folks like me want a nice spring bloom in April or May summer foliage, the leaf and uh, the leaf pattern and texture is what we're looking at most of the summer. So nice summer foliage and then autumn color when uh, September and October roll around. And then maybe some interesting features uh, that make you wanna look at that tree in the dead of winter. So we have trees like river birch and certain crab apples and hawthorns that have wonderful bark and also fruit 
that are colorful. So seasonal performance. We don't want a tree that's going to look good for six days and then uh, the rest of the year it's uh, not so interesting. So again, selecting uh, and, and being in touch with what is it that we're asking of that tree. Uh, they can offer so much. Next image, please. And then next image is particularities. And that's um, uh, what are the specifics? What are the... Um, idiosyncrasies, the predispositions. And I'll tell you right now, you got to know because Rutgers is telling people don't plant any ash trees. We've got the elm ash borer, uh, the emerald ash borer, and the emerald ash borer is just killing all our ash trees. So don't plant ash and think twice about some maples because we still have Asian longhorn beetle and be aware of this new blight that's affecting the beaches. Uh, beech trees, one of our favorite wonderful trees. There's now a beech tree blight going around and it's bad news, particularly in South Jersey. And often those pathogens move up uh, as the season progresses. So you got to know what your particular tree uh, is predisposed to um, and maybe find a resistant form uh, of that uh, tree. And a good example would be dogwoods selecting the types of dogwoods that don't get dogwood anthracnose and dogwood borers the way some of our native uh, uh, dogwoods do. So pest resistance, it's an important one. You take a tree like river birch, one of the 10 best small trees, it doesn't get any problems. Whereas other birches get borers and uh, bronze birch borers and birch leaf miners. So knowing which birch to get, uh, that's important. And then the particularities include flowers. Does it flower? Uh, do we like those flowers? Does it fruit? Do we like those fruit? We have some towns that planted ginkgo because ginkgo is a wonderful tree from Asia uh, with great fall color and um, resistance to urban pollution. But the female form produces these fruit that many towns say, you know what? These fruit fall. They have to be cleaned up uh, and, and they're considered odorous, although there are certain cultures that actually uh, treasure those fruit. So again, just knowing what you're in for and um, uh, being prepared uh, for any maintenance that follows. Sweet gum balls is another one. They drop so many sweet gum balls and uh, it could be um, something that presents a litter problem. So we have litter, we have natural litter from trees and acorns can be a problem, wing samaras, catkins, just knowing what that tree produces um, so there's no surprises. And then drought tolerance, so critical. We have a drought every few years. Sometimes we have a little bit of a drought within every summer. So how's that planting gonna do during the drought? We have oaks and crab apples, which are just wonderful at um, uh, living and tolerating drought periods once they're established. Uh, and then other trees like dogwoods, long after they're established, they still suffer during the drought because the roots are so darn close to the surface. So if we have prolonged periods of drought, then well-established dogs have to be watered. So um, know the drought tolerance. And the last uh, particularity is the hardiness. This is uh, Bergen County is zone six. I live in Sussex County, which is zone five, and uh, we want to know how cold it gets in the winter because zone six, usually you'll never get below minus 10 in the worst of years. Uh, zone five, you rarely get below 15 below uh, in the worst of years, but there are those trees, they have their breaking point and they'll be fine up until their uh, hardiness uh, limit and, and they'll just die. So we need to know all of these things. Next image, please. So here's one of my faves, and um, I've got a lot of faves. Uh, this is in the rose family, and a lot of the trees I'll show you today are in the rose family, which is known as the rosaceae. The rose family produces one of some of our favorite shrubs and vines, and in this case, tree. This is a hawthorn, and the fruit are called haws. And the thorns are called thorns. So it's called a hawthorn. 
Critigus is the Latin name. And I have one. And uh, last month was the Druid month of the Hawthorne for Druids Among Us. I'm one of them. And indeed, uh, this is a tree to be celebrated because it has great fall color. It has nice fruit, rich in vitamin C. Um, the birds will come in and harvest them. And that, that's nice too, to have a tree that calls in the songbirds. So uh, you're actually um, um, working with nature to bring in colorful songbirds to add to your quality of life. So uh, I love the hawthorn. It's not used very much, but there's some wonderful varieties and we'll look at them in a bit. But here's a tree that gives you four seasons of usefulness. And some of the uh, varieties are very small. So you can have one uh, and it really won't um, uh, overwhelm your property. It's good for a smaller property as well. Next image. And here's the bloom of the hawthorn. So there you go, a nice spring bloom in uh, early to mid-May. And then we have a nice leaf. The leaf is glossy and the leaf almost looks like a maple, doesn't it? And then some nice big thorns. So you don't wanna uh, back up into a hawthorn, but they're beautiful, just a lovely tree. And uh, there are some wonderful forms of varieties that the nurseries in Bergen County uh, will carry. Uh, and, and this time of year, the nurseries are uh, loaded with good choices. Next image. And this is a, a close up of the Washington Hawthorne, one of our choice uh, varieties. And it's just a lovely, lovely flower with a little red eye and a, a sweet, clean leaf. Just a, a, a wonderful choice. So Washington Hawthorne, one of our uh, highly recommended uh, varieties. Next image. And then we have the winter fruit. So again, the um, uh, fruit of, of certain hawthorns persists. Uh, this image was taken, I think, late January. And there's not a lot to see in nature. But lo and behold, the hawthorn is filled with gorgeous red fruit. Uh, I used to lecture a lot at the Frelinghuysen Arboretum in um, Morristown. And they have these uh, winter king hawthorns, they're called. And they're named because they uh, just hold their beauty. And then one day in February, the berries will be ripened and the songbirds will fly in like a scene from um, Alfred Hitchcock, The Birds. And it will uh, leave that uh, tree devoid of its fruit. Uh, but uh, what a nice uh, choice for winter interest. Next image. So uh, other small trees that are very popular include flowering plum and purple leaf plum, Prunus sericifera, very common, very inexpensive, really, um, if you compared it with some other choices. Uh, but while it has that interesting color foliage, which is quite purple, it doesn't live very long. So here's a case where knowing the characteristics, this tree will start to fail and decay after about 30 years. So that's considered a, a short life, but you know it might perform well and give you just what you want for a few decades and you'll deal with it as it starts to decline. Uh, but it's a good choice, a nice uh, small tree. Next image, we'll take a look at the flowers purple leaf plum, and there you go. So right, right here on the front lawn of this small property are, are these two purple leaf plums, and they're a beautiful, vibrant pink in May, one of the first uh, uh, woody plants, uh, small trees to bloom, and they bloom just beautiful. So uh, that tree is fully grown. It probably won't get any taller, and there it is probably uh, 20 feet tall considered a nice small tree. Next image. And a close up. Many of the plants in the rose family, and we mentioned hawthorn and here's plum, 
uh, another member of the rose family, have five petaled flowers. And also the flowers come before the leaves. So you have a very dramatic uh, look. And in Asian culture, the flowers of the, of the flowering plum are prized and used uh, as an element of, of, of art from nature. And you can see why. So purple leaf plum, good choice. Uh, a nice small tree for a small property. Next image. Uh, we have pears, ornamental pears. And again, it's a pear, so it's in the rose family, the rosaceae family. And here is an example of a very common ornamental pear called the Bradford pear. And these have been planted uh, ad nauseum, if you don't mind a little Latin, uh, overused, if you will. And you can go down many, many streets in many towns in Bergen County and adjacent suburban counties and find them. Um, the problem with the Bradford ornamental pear is that it has weak crotches, which means the weight of the snow and ice in the winter causes branches to break. And as they break, they rip the bark down with them mangling the tree. So these are no longer the best of the ornamental pears. Next slide image. Uh, but you could see why they were so popular because in late April, uh, we start to see uh, them, them emerging from their winter rest. The foliage is really nice. And it reminds me of aspens. It's glossy, uh, a very handsome leaf. So the ornamental pears are uh, valued for that. Next image. And again, um, uh, we get a wonderful spring bloom, as we'll see in the next image. There you go. So here's like every street uh, in northern New Jersey. Uh, and this is what we call a monoculture. And the monoculture means it's one plant used in, in, in exclusion of everything else. And the danger, if that one plant has a weakness or a pest or a disease or an insect or breakage problems, you're gonna have a lot of uh, damage rather than if you alternated with another variety. So they're no longer using the Bradford pear. There are other ornamental pears that towns are using now. One is called aristocrat. One is called Chanticleer, and I've planted the, the other improved varieties, and they don't have the breakage problem. But you got to uh, appreciate the um, uh, aesthetic of ornamental pears for an early spring bloom. Quite nice. Next image. These are also considered invasive because the birds are pooping out seeds from the teeny tiny fruit, and these trees are now appearing in old fields. And they're actually considered on the invasive list. So just be aware of that. And a close up of the Bradford uh, 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 ornamental pear. Again, it's a rose family. So you get the five petaled leaf, just a lovely, graceful um, a bloom. And early in the spring, um, you can see why they are so popular. And it's considered a small tree. Next. So small about today will max out at 35 feet, which means after 20, 20 years, they've reached their full height. And uh, that's a very useful category of trees, again, for smaller properties. Um, and the smaller they are, the more you can have. I used to spend all my money at um, some of the wonderful nurseries in Bergen County collecting trees. And I, I'm so happy because today I have uh, 15, 16, 17 different uh, of the small trees that we see here today. The medium trees, now we need a little bit more space and it's a little bit more of a commitment. They can get up to 55 feet. And then uh, a tall tree obviously is gonna get bigger. Um, you know, Some of our Norway spruces can get up to uh, 90 feet tall easily. And um, few of us have, uh, quite enough room for that. Fast growing trees put on a foot or more per year. And there are categories of fast growers. One of them is the 
purple leaf plum that we just saw. And slow growing trees only grow a few inches a year. So again, there are different categories of different growth forms, different habits. Next image. The next category of uh, plants is under the Latin name malus, M-A-L-U-S. Malus is the Latin name for the apple. It's also the Latin name for the crab apple. And the crab apple is uh, almost genetically identical, except the size of the fruit is much smaller. And indeed, our uh, modern day apples uh, are, are what they are today because we started, someone started with uh, selecting crab apples that were bigger and sweeter. And through selection and breeding, we have wonderful apple industry today. So apple uh, crab apples, like you'll see here, um, are grown for their flowers, typically, uh, although some people still do harvest crab apples to make uh, jellies and jams and such. Um, there are literally 500 varieties of cultivated crab apples. And a cultivated variety is called a cultivar. So there are 500, by now probably more, of different crab apples that are named forms that you can buy, you can order them through mail order supply, uh, and each has distinct characteristics. The color range, the size, the size of the fruit, the color of the fruit, uh, so many choices. But the key uh, elements, folks, are disease resistance. You must always think of a resistant variety so you don't have devastating diseases like apple scab, which will um, uh, just be a misery if, uh, if your tree gets infected with it. So always selecting apples and crab apples that are resistant to apple scab as well as other uh, key insects and diseases. So let's take a look at the crab apples. Next image. So many wonderful forms. So this is a image of one of the crab apples that only gets to 12 feet tall. It's called the carmine flowering crab apple. And here it is used around this city hall, a very um, uh, harsh ac architectural uh, uh, facade, if you will. And those trees are gonna provide color and soften up the, uh, uh, the whole appeal. They're gonna look smart and handsome uh, without getting too tall and presenting management issues and, and, and blocking those upstairs windows. So a nice small crab apple, carmine flowering crab apple, very useful around a school, hospital, office setting, and certainly a home. Next image. This is American Beauty. It's one of the older varieties of crab apple. American Beauty is touted for, for its disease resistance. And again, the flowers come before the leaves. So it's very dramatic. This is a rich uh, coral pink, five petal flower, American Beauty crab apple. Next image. Many of these are um, uh, available, as mentioned, through mail order, but our local nurseries uh, have wonderful, wonderful forms uh, for you, and you can have your selection uh, this time of year. What we're looking at here is a bad juxtaposition, and I call it the crab apple from hell, because in the front we see a dogwood, a nice white dogwood, it's looking nice, and then they came in with the crab apple thinking they were getting a smaller form, and lo and behold, this became a 30-foot uh, behemoth. So the crab apple, which is so, so big, dwarfs the dogwood, but it also blocks the house, presents too much shade. A little shade is nice to keep the house cool, but this is total obliteration. And these are homeowners who said they hadn't been able to see outside their windows for so, so long. And uh, taking down that crab apple was one of the happiest days of their lives. And it's not cheap, by the way, it could be a thousand bucks or more easy to remove uh, a, a tree that, that was a mistake. So the best advice is uh, avoid the mistake if you can. Of course, sometimes we inherit trees when we move or buy a property. Uh, so just know what you got and uh, decide if it's something worth keeping. This one was not. Next image. 
And again, a closer look at the carmine flowering crab apple, uh, 12 feet tall, 12 feet wide. So knowing that it gets 12 feet wide, you want to space them pretty far apart and let them connect. And today, this is a beautiful um, a continuous uh, row of color, and they don't cause too much uh, problem with blocking those lower windows. Next image. So um, do a little research, look up crab apples. There are, uh, again, so many forms. Here's a church setting with a beautiful white called snowdrift. And snowdrift is a very popular for crisp white crab apple, completely resistant. So these have now connected and form a whole circle of a color and um, uh, helps define the space as well as uh, drawing the eye away from uh, architecture alone uh, while enhancing the whole, uh, the whole setting. So uh, snowdrift, very common white crab apple. Very popular, I should say. Next image. And the crab apple has leaves just like the apple. They are dentate, which means there's little teeth around each leaf and they have a nice rich green color and um, really almost identical to apples. So crab apples and apples, but we want to pick forms that are resistant because the diseases will create blemishes and lesions on the leaves and on the flowers and on the stems that will make them uh, unacceptable. So again, going for disease resistant forms, so important. Next image. And uh, winter fruit. So here's a, a wonderful uh, crab apple variety that is actually uh, marketed for its fruit. So the fruit are just um, candy apple red and they persist on the plant. Um, I think the next image we'll see a, a yellow fruited form, which is shot in um, uh, February. So if you think about it, wow, a yellow fruited crab apple, that is just, just the ticket to um, uh, bring away the winter doldrums. And uh, we can have um, the winter fruit, we can have uh, leftover ornamental grasses, which look good through the winter. Uh, we can throw in the hawthorns and then have interesting bark, like the bark on a river birch or a paper bark maple. And you've got yourself a nice winter scape. Next image. I'm happy to get into the dogwoods next. And the dogwoods you'll see, uh, there are native forms and there are Asian forms. This is the native form and you could tell because the colorful bract, uh, the red or white bract, which is not a flower, it's a, more like a leaf, the colorful bract is rounded. Later you'll see that the uh, bract on the Asian forms is more pointed. What are the flowers of the dogwood? Those yellow structures in the center, those are the true flowers. So they're rather ho-hum, but the bracts are there to guide the pollinator to come in and pollinate. We, of course, love the bracts because they're just so um, appealing. The dogwoods are pretty well faded. They were in bloom uh, uh, several weeks for several weeks, pretty much last month in May. Um, and we love the native forms. Next image. But we recognize that the native Cornus Florida shown here uh, is prone to certain diseases like uh, dogwood anthracnose and dogwood borer. And it's become so bad that Rutgers tells people, you know, uh, consider the Kuzas or, or the Kuza hybrids, which we'll see next, because as dogwoods go, uh, they're much more resistant. So here's the fall color and um, having some dogwoods in the fall scape is very nice. They're typical burgundy, which plays nicely off of evergreens and uh, other taller forms. So uh, they earn their keep, next image. Uh, and in a good year, the dogwoods uh, are a very um, nice part of the October palette in the garden and landscape. Next image.
And here, whoops, whoops, go back to that one. You would. That was a uh, kuza, and here's a close-up. Coming up your way. I'm a little, I don't know, I just froze for a second. Okay, okay. well, then just go forward. If you can't go backwards, yeah. it's okay. Uh, the kuz is here, look at it, and we see the bract comes to a point. So you've got the flower in the center, and the bract comes to a point. So that tells you this is either a pure cornice kuza, also known as the Chinese dogwood, Japanese dogwood, we call it the Asian dogwood, or it's a hybrid. And Rutgers, I'm proud to say, hybridized the Asian forms with the native forms and produced dozens of new varieties. And some have uh, characteristics more of the Asian form, uh, others, um, uh, carry characteristics of both. There's so many wonderful choices. The good news is that the Cornus Cusa doesn't get any of those problems that the native forms get. So um, we, we tout them, gorgeous. Uh, they don't come in pink yet, but uh, they do come in white. And the Cusa is in bloom right now, at least up here in Sussex County. So you can still see them. Next image, please. And I love my uh, variegated dogwoods. So we have dogwoods like this one called Gold Star, and the leaf is variegated, which means it has combinations of green and white, sometimes green and uh, cream, or um, mine is actually green and gold, uh, uh, another one. So Gold Star, how fabulous. So they're beautiful. And then they produce their bracts and you think this has got to be one of the 10 best small trees and I highly recommend it. Cornus Cusa Gold Star. Next image. And then we have uh, Circus. Now Circus is another uh, uh, genus of tree, C-E-R-C-I-S, but I show it to you today because it's very small. Only gets to about 18 feet after 20 years. So Circus is perfect for a small property. It'll take sun, it'll take shade. The common name is Redbud. And let's take another look at the next slide for another shot of Redbud. You've seen them. It has a heart-shaped leaf, which reminds me of aspens. And the leaf is a beautiful texture. It stays clean and um, shiny, so a nice uh, leaf to look at in the summer. Next image. Redbud produces beautiful pink or uh, lilac or hot pink or even lavender colored blooms in great profusion. You've seen them, um, but close up we see just how lovely they are. Just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these teeny tiny blooms. Next image. Um, red bud is one of the earliest to bloom, and here we see it blooming uh, in a backyard where it's pretty shady and just claiming everyone's attention for that uh, uh, two-week period. They bloom really in April, uh, late April we see them, red bud. So a good choice, and it's not done performing yet. Next image, you'll see that the fall color is uh, quite nice as well. So in a good year, you get a banana yellow color on red bud, which plays so beautifully off of the purple on a dogwood. And um, you're onto a beautiful palette for the whole month of October. So selecting for fall color, you know, October has really become one of my favorite times of year because the leaves are still on and some of them are as colorful as they were when they were blooming in the spring. So red bud versus canadensis, a good choice. But in the next slide, I want you to see that it does have a predisposition to scale insects. So take a look at that bottom limb and you'll see, oh, probably thousands of individual scales, which are an insect that sucks the nutrients right through the bark. So knowing that, we would get in there and spray it with something like horticultural oil, which is relatively free of risk, or just prune it off, which is what we did in this case. 
but monitoring for scale because we know that that's an insect that can threaten the red bud. Next image. And uh, while I will show you the Japanese maple, I will ask you to please never ever do this to the shrubs in front of your house. We do not want shrubs that look like green meatballs. This homeowner was, um, well, I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but uh, this is a very unnatural thing to do. It's not healthy for the shrub. The whole interior of that shrub is dead. No light penetrates. So when we do that shearing, you create a very thin uh, skin of live tissue. And then if there's any break, uh, you end up with an with a, a unacceptable injury with a big gaping hole in it. So if you like that round shape, choose something that has that round shape naturally and do not shear shrubs. Uh, who has that round shape? Boxwood does and Japanese holly does. So that's the, uh, what I would much have preferred. These are probably for scythias or azaleas or something. And there are, I guarantee you they're all dead by now. But I digress. I wanted you to look at the Japanese maple in the center of this image. And Japanese maple sure is a beauty. Next image, they come broadleaf form and they come in a, a dissected feathery leaf form. Uh, they come in burgundy and they come in chartreuse. So um, uh, they're so exotic and uh, considered a very valuable small tree. So this is a burgundy form called blood good Japanese red maple. Just a lovely, lovely specimen. Next image. Magnolia uh, is another tree to consider. They're all done blooming but on the right is the bloom of the um, Magnolia stellata, the star magnolia. On the left is the Magnolia sulangiana, the saucer magnolia. Next image. And here they are growing. You've seen them. They look great, totally resistant to uh, the elements and no insects and diseases. Next image. And close up, so lovely, Magnolia sulangiana, saucer magnolia, comes in a number of different uh, forms. Very tolerant of pollution, so good for our cities. Next image. And the leaf of the magnolia, it's not as glossy and uh, as appealing as some, but there it is. And there's the bud that's going to become next year's flower. Next image. I love the Magnolia stellata. This is the star Magnolia, much smaller. And you could see the usefulness of this plant. So um, I guess mine was blooming uh, first week of May. Just a lovely, lovely choice. Close up, next image, please. Magnolia stellata, the star Magnolia. Uh, it looks like it should be fragrant, but it's not, uh, at least not to my nose. Next image. Great, great performer though. Full sun, uh, lovely choice for early, early spring bloom. And probably the last of my small trees today is this one called Amelanchier. Amelanchier uh, appears as a tall shrub or a small tree, depending on if it has a single trunk or multiple trunks. Uh, it's native and it's called uh, um, commonly shadbush or shad blow, also known as service berry. Next image, uh, Amelanchier is in the rose family. So you get a lovely bloom, five petals, great choice. It blooms when the shad fish are swimming upstream to spawn, so they call it shad blow. And it also produces a wonderful berry, uh, rich in vitamin C called the service berry. Next image, because it was the earliest fruit in the landscape. So early pioneers were quick to harvest those uh, berries, they're actually more like rose hips because this is a member of the rose family and those rose hips provide a good source of vitamin C for early people, uh, early pioneers who were dependent on the landscape for uh, fresh uh, nutrient value, things like this. So Amelanchier, Shadbush, Shadblow, Serviceberry, gorgeous.
I think I got one or two more slides of this particular trait. Next image. Yeah, there we go. So they look good on NOS. This is six of them together, softening up this school uh, architecture. Next image. They look great around a, an aquatic pond, a woodland garden. They are sun, part sun, part shade. I love it. So I've had one uh, and I just treasure it. So again, part sun, part shade, moist site. They're very beautiful, carefree, um, not formal, but just a, a beautiful um, native small tree. Next image. So uh, where I used to get my inspiration, I would go to Arborita. Uh, and this is one in uh, Summit called Reeves Reed Arborita. We also have an Arborita at the uh, at Wyckoff uh, James McFall Wildlife Center. Uh, that's also an Arboretum and that's in Wyckoff. Um, and to be an Arboretum, you have to have 150 different varieties of woody plants. And uh, there's always something to look at, four seasons of the year. Um, and that's what we wanna do, bring some of that into our landscape wherever possible by selecting plants that call in the birds or provide color. Uh, don't forget what else we get from trees. We can have shade if we want shade. Um, we can have um, plants that will suck up water if, if um, there is some moisture. Again, not standing water, but if there's some moisture, we can plant something like um, a red maple or an amelanchier or a river birch to suck up some of that water. And we really, uh, should value trees because they do stir and we don't want to cut them down uh, unless it's absolutely necessary because a single tree can sequester uh, tens of thousands of gallons of water, water that would otherwise run across a property and cause pollution. So we value trees for their ability to uh, hold water, take it out of the uh, system where it might be causing erosion and runoff. Um, and similarly, they're sequestering carbon, um, which is going to be released if that wood is cut down and it rots or, or it's burned. Uh, so uh, the sequestering of carbon and water are very valuable. And then through photosynthesis, these trees are um, giving off pure oxygen. And uh, many of us here breathe oxygen. I know I'm one of them. So the closer you get to a tree or a green plant, the more pure oxygen will be available to you and, and uh, fresh oxygen is always uh, appreciated. Let's see if we have any more slides. I think we're at the end and might be time to pass out the exam. I think there's one or two more images. Maybe. Let's see. Okay, there we go. And that is the end. No, nope. so uh, there are, uh, whoop, all right, now that's the end. Uh, I just wanted to show that slide was a tree spade. And uh, the message is you can bring in a tree service and they can give you a 20 foot tree and you could have instant shade, instant screening of those neighbors that you hate, instant uh, uh, presence of a, a pine for, evergreen value. So don't overlook. You don't have to start with a seedling from Arbor Day and wait 80 years. You can pay the price, but you know what? It's money well spent to have instant gratification starting tomorrow uh, to have a 20 foot tree. It's awesome. And that tree doesn't even know it's been planted because the tree spades that they use uh, protects the root system um, and in many ways, it's uh, better than digging a hole and unwrapping the burlap and the nylon and hoping that the tree gets off to a good start. So consider that. And if you have problems with trees, do call licensed tree experts. They're listed as LTE, licensed tree experts. They're also listed as licensed arborists. If they're not an LTE, or an arborist, they're just guessing. 
So we have wonderful people in Bergen County. I'm not allowed to mention any, but look for service providers uh, when it comes to uh, solving problems with your particular trees and you want your tree to uh, thrive and give you many, uh, many, 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 many years and decades of uh, satisfaction. So let's not forget our licensed tree experts and licensed many excellent people out there uh, serving Bergen County. So at this point, I think uh, we would entertain any questions, Larissa. Yes, we have a, a question from our participants. Uh, this is from Dale. I gave my son a tricolor beech tree as a wedding gift. Is there anything he can do to try to protect it from the pathogen you mentioned? He lives in Bound Brook. Is yes. There, there's a second. Um, I'm familiar with the tricolor beech. It is by nature a weaker form. It is uh, not as robust as uh, the other forms, but it's certainly a pretty thing, isn't it? Um, over the years, I've seen them um, uh, not perform with, again, the, 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 the robust, uh, thriving uh, uh, characteristics that you would expect. Are they uh, susceptible to the new beach disease? I don't even know. It's so new, the pathologists are just beginning to respond. Hopefully not. How do you know? You would see broad parallel lines on the leaves, big black broad lines, almost bizarre looking, parallel to the veins on the leaves. You would know instantly something is really wrong uh, and there's no cure for it. So um, hopefully uh, it's in a good spot. Beaches need full sun and hopefully the soil is uh, supplying all the nutrition that it needs. So uh, running a soil test, always a good idea. Next um, question. Dale is also wondering if the proximity of other beaches could be a risk factor. Well, you can't really move them, can you? Um, if there's a beach tree that's infected, yeah, that's a risk factor. But we're just starting to get a sense of where the disease is. Unfortunately, it's been identified in Bergen and Monmouth counties, but it's suspected that as the warm weather sets in, it's going to be uh, rearing its ugly head in many other places. Google what you can to find out about it. There's no fact sheets yet, but it is indeed a beach blight, and uh, Rutgers is um, responding as people uh, call and say, I think I may have it, and indeed, we have it already in Bergen County. Next image. Uh, or um, next question. <laughs> Melody is wondering, she has a very efficiently worded question, purple plum and black knot treatment. Yeah. So uh, plums are very prone to black knot. Um, I think that you would find less of it on the cultivated varieties than on some uh, native forms where they just look horrible and you don't want to get on a fungicide program for black knot but I'm pretty sure we have uh, forms of Prunus sericifera, purpley plum, that are resistant to black knot. And uh, that would be an easy question for one of our bigger nurseries, whether it's um, Rossler's Allendale Nursery that has a fabulous selection of many of these woody plants. And you could ask them uh, directly. Good question though, because we want to be sure it is resistant to black knot. Well, let's see, I don't see any other questions from the participants, but I was wondering about pruning trees. I know that could probably yes. be a whole other. Yes, yes, it can. That could be a 15 week college course. I like the so time what's, of year. What's the question? I'm wondering, like, what's the best? Is there a, a good time of year to prune? Or okay. is it for certain purposes? It all depends on what you're pruning. Um, be aware, folks, um, that many trees preset their flower buds. What does that mean? That means that uh, dogwood trees and crab apples, the trees that have already bloomed, magnolias, they are already forming the bud that's going to be next year's bloom. Now, if you run around and prune in summer, you just removed next year's flower bud. So the key is to know what plant you're pruning 
why you're pruning and understanding the best timing. So for a plant that presets its um, buds, like the ones mentioned, you wanna get in there and do your pruning immediately after the flowers fade, but before the new flower bud has been set. For other plants, it's not as important, although we have certain plants that are called bleeders, which means if you prune them at the wrong time of year, they're gonna bleed sap, dogwoods and elms and certain maples. So you don't want them weeping sap all over your car or the walkway and something. And the last thing to know is why the heck you're pruning. We don't prune just because you uh, want to get some exercise and you found your old pruners in the basement. Pruning is to either remove a dead and damaged limb, to stimulate new growth, or to restore the shape. That's it. We don't prune anymore just for the sake of it because pruning is wounding. And every time we make a wound, that's an entry point for an insect or a disease to enter. And there's just too many insects and diseases out there. The last thing we wanna do is create entry points. So there better be a good reason why you're pruning. Call my office, we'll be glad to talk you out of it. And I, I have one last question about um, native versus uh, getting a plant that, it, or a tree that might be like a Japanese maple or a tree that is like, or the Japanese dogwoods, um, because we, we've had a couple of programs that focus a lot on native plants yes. and need to um, sustain this local ecosystem. But can yes. a, another, like a, a kusa dogwood or a maple do that here? Well, um, it depends on really how, uh, what lengths you want to go to have um, pure native plantings. Uh, Rutgers will be the first to say, yes, we want to use our native plants. They belong here. They evolved here. They are part of the web of life here. The predator-prey relationships are in place. Um, and if you bring something in from somewhere else, you never quite know how it's going to fit in. And uh, if it has pests, maybe the predators won't go to control those pests because uh, it's new to them. So. Uh, but then there are cases like with the dogwoods, where the native dogwoods are so susceptible that Rutgers says, you know what, the hybrids or the Asian forms are simply better. My, my response, have them both. Life is short. Enjoy the native forms. And right now my kuzas are blooming. So if I didn't have the wonderful kuzas and the hybrids, I, I wouldn't have a dogwoods blooming now. Um, we want to avoid invasive plants. So we don't want to introduce invasive plants, plants that are going to outcompete with the natives. And uh, as mentioned, the Bradford pear is uh, being called guilty of being a little invasive, uh, showing up in uh, fields and stuff as birds poop out the seeds. But um, just because a plant's exotic and comes from another country doesn't mean it's bad. Sometimes it's superior. Uh, but there have been a lot of mistakes made, a lot of um, uh, unfixable problems. Uh, uh, we've introduced a lot of insect pests from the gypsy moth uh, uh, at uh, uh, Asian longhorn beetles. So we want to be very careful. But let's face it, these Asian forms are grown here now. They're not like brought in from China every time we want one. So our local nurseries, our breeders, uh, they, they have them and we should use them and feel good about it. That's very helpful, yes. <laughs> Rather have a thriving tree than, yeah, something. Right, you don't wanna to have to deal with pests all the time. Yes, and uh, I think that's all I, the questions I have. And I don't know if anybody else has any last ones, but um, I think, I think that I've, I, this has been so fascinating. I'm so excited that we had a chance to speak to you today. Thank you so much, Joel. And uh, like I said, this is going to be on um, our website later. And also Joel is um, wanted, uh, there's another fun event coming up in September, mid-September. There's going to be the Fall Harvest Festival in Van Sant Park. Uh, there'll be master gardeners there and local farms will be yes. uh, having- Yes, thank you, Larissa. Yes, I wanted to September add- September 18th and 19th. Family fun, free, everybody's welcome. Vanson Park, educational displays, the Rutgers Master Gardeners, 4-H, a complete carnival, full-blown carnival, food trucks, and craft vendors. You're going to love it. So come on out. 
May, uh, uh, September 18th and 19th, Banson Park, and come by and say hello. Wow, that sounds like that sounds like a lot of fun. But, um, but thank you so much, Joel, and thank, thank you, you, everybody, for coming this afternoon. And I hope to see you again at a future event. Thanks so much, Love Joel, it. for your time. Thank this you. is great. Thanks. Bye bye. bye. bye.